One of the things that I learned about Rabbi Yankel in the uh, last week was uh, how little I knew about what was really going on in the yeshiva. So many things uh, were taking place with Rabbi Yankel. We set him up with the Chavrusa. We didn't know that that Chavrusa would carry over to his home, to Shabbos, to the middle of the week. A lot of things that we weren't aware of, I wasn't aware of. Because everything was quiet, hidden. Hashem Shemayim. I might add Shalom and Asla Kabul Pras to a great degree. A few points that I want to talk about. Yankel's impact on the yeshiva, as Rabbi Karlinsky mentioned, first of all, the founding of the yeshiva, the merger of the yeshiva, illustrated great talents as a, as a matchmaker. He saw two yeshivas, and he was able to see the strengths, what each one had to offer, what each one needed, that they were compatible. There was a koach to make a shidduch, a koach to be a matchmaker. And not so easy. There was one other very important shidduch that I know of that Rabbi Yolin made, Rabbi Uncle made. And that was the shidduch between our yeshiva and Rabbi Farber. She Lachaim Toivim Baruchim. And as we know, that yeshiva wouldn't be the same yeshiva. The success of so many of our Talmidim, of the Ruchnis of the yeshiva, hinges on that shidduch that was made a dozen years ago. I don't know how long. Maybe two dozen years, was that? How many years ago? 20 already. 20 already. Okay, that's right. Time flies when you're having fun. What is a matchmaker? A matchmaker is somebody who is not interested in his own receipts to the background. He brings together the people and the center stage is the chosen, the kala. Those are the, those are the center stage. Those are the ones who everybody looks at, everybody sees what's going on. Rabbi Yankel was the person who receded to the background. He never pushed himself forward in any way and it was only when he was pushed, and only when he was, I remember that we wanted him to speak once, and Yom Yerushalayim. And he had a fascinating story to tell about his being here and during the Six Day War. Fascinating story. But how much do I just twist his arm, get him to stand up in front of the Tzibor and just share 15 or 20 minutes of his experiences? A matchmaker takes the potential that is there and helps it reach its fulfillment, shapes it, making it express its full potential. This is one point that I wanted to say about Rivianko. Second point, Rivianko was a person who was deeply connected. He was an Eon person. I heard from his sons at the Shiva, and we knew this to be true from our experiences with him, that learning Bikiyas was foreign to him. When he learned something, he had to plumb the depths of the Sugya to connect to it so that it could be part of him. And his friendships were Bikiyas. Deep, loving, caring. Too numerous to count. I think most of us would be happy if we had two or three friends with the same degree of depth and love and care that Rav Yankel could count in the hundreds. His learning wasn't wide-ranging. It was focused on the classical yeshiva shesugyas that he grew up with, 
under a baron, Zecher Tzadok Levrocha, and others. But it was deep and focused and connecting. And this gave him the koach to connect with his heart to the hundreds who knew him. His koach to penetrate to the essence of a divrei Torah that he was learning, that he was hearing, I believe is the same koach that helped him connect with the people to understand who they were and to create those deep and enduring relationships. Third point. Everyone felt, and everyone felt that to Rabbi Yankel, he was a Ben Yochid, his only son. Everybody felt that my relationship with Rabbi Yankel is special. How do I know? Because I see, I hear, because I felt it myself. When I would go to Rabbi Yankel and I would say to Rabbi Yankel, I need to talk to somebody. I need advice. I remember a number of years ago that when I was starting in Shaduchim for my children, what do you go to? How do you get started? What do you talk, how, how do you talk to a mechutin? Well, what, what happens? What, is, what questions are you supposed to ask when you're checking out a bocher or checking out a girl? How do you do it? What do you talk to? Rabbi Yankel, Baruch Hashem. He's 15 years older than me. And uh, he had the experience. How do you buy a dira? Who do you talk to? How do you get a mortgage? Who do you talk to? Rabbi Yankel was there for me. And I would say, hey, come down to my office, Rabbi Yankel. I have to ask you a few questions. We would sit 15, 20 minutes. He would tell me whatever I asked. I felt that was very special. He spent a lot of time, cared about me, cared about everybody. We say that a person's chayiv to say, Bishvili nivra ha'ola. That's what a person should say. Bishvili, the world was created for me, and I always had a kasha. Doesn't that create egotism? A person says, the world was created for me. That means that I'm the center of the world. The teretz is, that when a person says Bishvili Nivra Olam, he has to understand that there's lots of other people who are also saying Bishvili Nivra Olam. And they're all right. So it's not that Bishvili Nivra Olam and for nobody else. It's Bishvili Nivra Olam and Bishvil Khan, Bishvilo, and Bishvil everybody. The world, I understand that I have a relationship with Akadaj Baruch, Hu, which is unique. Akadaj Baruch Hu created me and I'm a sufficient reason for there to have been a creation if I do what I'm supposed to do. Because Baruch Hu created me for, so I can reach the level that I was meant to reach. But he created millions and billions of other people for the same purpose. Bishvili nivra ola. Rabbi Ankel's relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu was, he was HaKadosh Baruch Hu's ben yachid. He understood that Bishvili nivra ola. But he also knew that he wasn't the only one. He also knew that Kodesh Baruch Hu loved every other Jew as much as he loved him. And this ability is what helped Rabbi Yankel emulate the ways of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The Viholachto Bidrochov, and he could open his heart, and he could see, and he could find the place in his heart for every Jew whom, with whom he came into contact. I haven't yet mentioned any Divrei Chazal. And I have to because I know that Rabbi Yanko would never would have enjoyed a Hesped without a good Chazal. And one thing that I always tried to do when I spoke and he was there at a shmuz, at a, a shir, I never wanted to disappoint with Rabbi Yanko. He was my maven, and I understood. If he understood, if he said it was good, I believed him, and it was good. And as Rabbi Kalmiji said, he always said it was good. Except for the time he came to me, he said, uh, I, when I said a shir, he said, I don't think I was holding enough in the sugya to understand exactly what you meant. 
That was his nice way of saying you didn't explain it well. <laughs> that was his, that's how he said it. They'll say a chazal. Pirkei Avos. Omer Rabbi Yaisi. Kol ha-mechaber es ha-teira gufo mechuber al Whoever honors Torah, his body becomes honored to other people. And someone who desecrates the Torah, his body becomes desecrated, becomes defiled. And the Silas Hesharim, Perak Yutesk asks, he puts in the mouth of the people who, the Silas Hesharim says, people are trying to to lighten the burden of Avodah Hashem. Why does Hashem need covered for? Why, does the, why do we have to honor the Torah? Why do we have to give to honor to the mitzvahs? Kaddish Baruch Hu should be beyond these externals. We have to honor a person because a person might be interested in having covered. It's a weakness to desire covered. Kaddish Baruch Hu has no weaknesses. Kaddish Baruch Hu doesn't need covered. It's a kasha that the Mesilas Yisharim says. He goes on to say, Mesilas Yisharim, that of course he proves from many sources how important it is to give kavod to the Torah and how important it is to give Torah importance to, to kavod to the mitzvahs. But still, we have to try to understand why is it so important? And why the emphasis on the guf? Gufo mechuber al abrios. The body is mechuber al abrios. Gufo mechul al abrios. What's the point of talking about the guf? First of all, what is the kavod of the Torah? So I was thinking that the kavod that we give to Torah does mean to respect Torah, to give honor to Torah. We have a concept in halacha called achshive. To when something has the importance that you impart to it. Something may not have objective importance or whatever importance it has, how you relate to it. Your machshiv something, that's the importance that it has for you, and that's the importance that it has on the world. A quote from the Shem Yishmuel and Parshish Truma. The Shem Yishmuel says that the Torah has a guf and a neshama. We have the externals of the Torah, the dinim of the Torah, the statements of the Torah. Anybody can open up the Torah and read it and see what it says. The Torah also has a neshama. The Torah has a, a soul. That's how we can love the Torah. We can love the Torah because we can relate to the soul of the Torah. And the neshama of the Torah is HaKadosh Baruch Hu, presence in the Torah. And he writes as follows. Valkain ishalome Torah. A person who learns Torah. Im lo made beregesh pinimi shebo. If he learns with his inner feelings, be ahava ubechiba, with love and affection, le elokus shebe Torah. For the divinity, for the godliness that's found in Torah, le umaso zoche le pnimius shebe Torah. To that extent, he will be zocha to the inner essence of Torah. But if he only learns the externals of the Torah, if he is not devoted to seeking out the secrets of the Torah, what's lying the Torah in, inside the Torah? Loshan of Rashi and Shabbos, Lamaiminimbo, Lamasmiilimbo. The Torah is a sam hachayim for those who learn Torah with the right hand. What does the right hand mean? Trudim b'chol kocham l'da soda, says Rashi. The people who are involved with all of their strength to seek out the sod, the secret of what Torah is. That's who people are. That's the Torah that you learn with your right hand, with all of your strength. And for them, the Torah is orech yomim b'mina. It's eternal. It gives you the olam haba. It gives you the connection which is to Hakadosh Baruch Hu, which is everlasting. 
V'im eno lo made ela bechitzoni yuso, says the Shem Bishmuel, ain lo betorah ela gufa Torah, v'lo ela kutshaba. Then he only has the outside of the Torah. He doesn't touch the inner essence, the divinity, the godliness of Torah. There's no connection. There's no connection between his soul and the soul of the Torah because he's only learning what's written on the outside. And when we're talking about the Pneumia Satera, certainly when we're talking about Rabbi Yankel, doesn't mean to learn Kabbalah, doesn't mean to learn Sisrei Torah. It means to take a push it, to take the Pshat and the Ruach Gemara and the Rashi, the Taisus, the Marsha, and seek out what does it really mean? What is he trying to tell me? How can I get a deeper understanding of what's being written, what's written, what's being said? And that person who really wants to get to the secret of Torah is able to connect to the Elokus of Torah as well. This describes Kavad Torah. Penetrating from the outside in. Let's say another small chiddush. The Kavad Torah flows from what I don't know about Torah. When a person learns Torah and it opens up for him and he understands something, but from understanding some, that little thing, that thing that he understands, doors are open, gates are open, where he sees how much there is that I don't understand about this very thing that I just learned and this very thing that I just understood. I understood that there was a kasha here, but this kasha opens up so much, makes, opens up the possibilities of thinking, vistas of imagination, of understanding are open before me. There's so much that I don't know. That person is mechabe the Torah because that not knowing of the Torah comes from his deep source of wanting to learn and brings out that deep source of I want to know more. If somebody learns Torah and judges the Torah, measures the Torah by what he knows, so then it's very limited. He doesn't see the beauty of Torah. All he sees is what he knows. He says, oh, what you see is what you get. I chopped it. I got it. That's a mevaz of Torah. A mechabed of Torah is one who learns the Torah and knows that for everything I know, there's an infinity that I didn't learn. For every gate that I open, there's a hundred more gates that are closed before me, and I want to open those too. And every one, he walks in and further and further, deeper and deeper into the Torah. Torah reveals its secrets to those who don't know Torah deeply. And then your goof is misguided. Why the goof? Because people see your goof, your body, as a clea for infinity. Because the goof of a person, you can either look at the goof of the person, the person is the body, the externals, or you look at the person and you say, that person, that's, that's much more than the externals. That person holds within him a tselem elokim. That person holds within him an infinity, an eternity. Rabbi Yankel's goof was miskabed, al he was zochet to a levaya. He was zochet to gedolei olam, attending his levaya, speaking. Uh, his goof was miskabi because people understood that in this goof, the goof that was purified through Yisurim over the last year, Kodesh Baruch Hu was mimarek him, cleansed him, so that he could become closer and closer to Kodesh Baruch Hu. His goof was miskabi al abrius. Bianco was that Mechabed Atera who was looking for the divine in every word of Tera, and the same Mita governed his interpersonal relations. He was Mechabed Sabrios because he was able to connect his divine Chelek Elokami Mal with everyone else's, big or small, Talmud Chochem or Amoritz. And when Rabbi Yaakov would say, as Rabbi Karolinsky mentioned earlier, I'll learn with anybody on any level but on one condition, that he has a desire to learn, it's because Rabbi Yankov wanted that learning to be neshama to neshama. 
If there wasn't the desire to connect with the inside of Torah, then it wasn't going to be a connection that he valued. He didn't want somebody who just listened and to hear the goof of the Torah. Somebody who just was a, was being Yotze, understanding, attending the base Medrash. He wanted to learn with somebody who, like him, shared that desire to understand what's inside the Torah. Bianco was Zoche. Medrash says in Parshish Truma, Yesh lecha Adam lokeach mekach. You have a person who takes a purchase. Ubnei Adam enum yodi mahu. And people don't know the value of what he has, of what he bought. Avu mischar hasarsur nisvada malokach. But from the payment that is made to the sarser, to the middleman, to the one who made the deal, to the person who was the go-between. If you see, how much did he get paid? If he got paid a little bit so you know that the deal wasn't a very, very, wasn't a, 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 an expensive deal, wasn't a big deal. If he got paid a lot, you see, the value of the merchandise that changed hands must have been very, very great. Kacha Torah ain't alam yodea mahi. Ella bischar shelokach Moshe. We only we only know what the Torah is from the schar that Moshe Rabbeinu received because it says in the pasuk, "U Moshe lo yoda ki koran orpon of bedabro ito." That Moshe's face received the the karne hod, and from that we understand how great the Torah is. Yaakov was, Yaakov was a sarser, a matchmaker, a matchmaker between people, a matchmaker between institutions, a matchmaker between Yidin and Torah. What was his schar? We know how great that Torah was from the schar, the schar that he had, beautiful family, sons, sons-in-law, daughters, daughters-in-law. Oivde Hashem, Talmide Chachomim. From the schar of the hundreds of friends who cared about him, loved him deeply, it was a great schar that he had, and we know what it was all worth, and we know its value. May his memory be a blessing and inspiration for all of us.